Well, thank you for the invitation to be here, and uh, I'll try to cover this, but I'm going to spend a little bit less time on some of the mundane stuff. Uh, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this. I wanted to give you a little bit about background because I never really gave much thought to it. You know, just every once in a while, a new staging system comes out, and you kind of adopt it, and never really thought much about, you know, how the hell does this happen? You know, who makes these decisions? How do you make the decisions? And so forth. So I think it's useful to think a little bit about uh, what, you know, what do we want out of a stage classification system? So mainly it allows us to communicate about the anatomic extent of disease. That allows us to, when we read a paper, to say, you know, the patient I'm seeing kind of fits what was reported in that paper. I think I can apply this data. We can run studies. Uh, you know, we can, we can do a lot of things with that. It also gives us an assessment of prognosis of patients because certainly the disease burden that they have is an important factor. Um, but fundamentally, it really is a, uh, an ability to uh, describe the anatomic extent of disease. You know, that's fundamentally what it is. And the rest of it is how we use that. You know, we use that to guide our treatment. We use that to talk about patients. We use that to estimate prognosis. Um, but it's fundamentally, you know, describing anatomic extent of disease. I just want to emphasize another point that I think often gets uh, missed. So uh, clinical staging is all information prior to any treatment. Pathologic staging is only after you've done a resection. So if you do a mediastinoscopy, it's a surgical procedure, there's a path report, but it's still part of clinical staging. So this is kind of what happened, you know, the uh, earlier editions of the staging system were really based on very limited number of patients. And back in 1996, uh, ISLAC kind of amounted a big effort. And so the last edition we had and the current edition are really based on a lot more patients and uh, a big global database. There are differences, though, when you look in that database. So, you know, this is just looking at the T, but, you know, it doesn't matter how you look at it. Depends on what region the data came from, depends on what type of database it was. There's a lot of variability that's sort of buried underneath that. Uh, and I think we forget about that sometimes. Another thing that is striking to me, and I really want to study this more to understand this better, is there has been a dramatic improvement in survival, stage for stage, and for all patients. So if you look at the 1990, 1990 to 1999 ISLAC database of almost 100,000 patients, and then the second 1999 to 2010 database, there's about a 30% improvement in survival, stage for stage, and it's not just stage shift. Um, and I don't think we really understand exactly why that is. Okay, so uh, prognosis. You know, a lot of people look to the stage classification system as a method to predict prognosis. And I think you have to take that with a large grain of salt and be careful about that. Uh, certainly, anatomic extent of disease has a major impact on patients' prognosis. Um, but there are a lot of other factors that make a difference. So, you know, really the bottom line is if you're looking to the stage classification system for a prognosis, well, if you want to know prognosis from a decade earlier, 1999 to 2010, patients across the world, so you're averaging out all that regional variability that I showed you, you have no real idea how those patients were treated, whether they're treated the same way that you're planning to treat your patient, you know, it will give you that. But then once again, if there's a 30% improvement in survival that we saw in the past, you know, it's 2018, you know, does that data from a decade earlier actually give us the prognosis of our patients today? I think that's questionable. So, you know, take it with a huge grain of salt if you're using that as your method for predicting prognosis. And I'll say just a little bit more about prognosis. You know, there are environmental factors or tumor factors or patient-related factors. It may be region that you're in. It may be healthcare system. Um, for 
Oh, I'm not advancing here. Okay. Um, anatomic extent of disease is a major thing, but there are genetic mutations that have an impact. There's pet intensity. There are a lot of other uh, factors. Um, Patient-related factors, a patient who's 50 years old has got a different outlook than a patient who's 85 years old, comorbidities, uh, lots of other factors there. It depends on what your outcome of interest is. So it can be recurrence, it can be survival, it can be uh, toxicity, potential for toxicity, and it depends on when you're assessing it. So prognosis, you know, once you've finished resection is different from prognosis a year later. A year later, they've already survived a year with no, no events, so it changes. So it's a complicated thing. Another thing is that, you know, the contribution of something to prognosis may, may uh, vary. So, you know, for a stage one lung cancer, you know, it may be that uh, the treatment is the thing that drives a lot of it. And a lot of it is unknown. You don't know if your patient's going to get hit by a bus or have an MI or some other thing because they're actually going to be cured. On the other hand, a stage four patient, uh, it may be tumor-related things that drive prognosis a lot. Um, and treatment may not drive it much uh, if you have no mutation. But if you have a mutation and you're going to get uh, targeted uh, therapy, then that may have a very different factor. So, you know, Really predicting prognosis is a complicated thing and depends on a lot of different factors. And I think we have to do something much more sophisticated than just say, okay, you're a, you know, stage whatever, stage 1A, but, you know, if your age is over 75 or if you have a mutation, then bump that up a notch or bump it down a notch or something like that. I think that really doesn't meet what we want. So that's a little bit of background. So how do we decide what to do? Uh, where to draw the line between different groups? And since prognosis per se doesn't actually work, uh, you know, what do you do? So what the staging committee ended up saying is that something had to look like a good place to draw the line in multiple uh, assessments. So. Uh, if three centimeters was a good place to draw the line between T1 and T2, that had to be useful in North America, in Europe, in Asia for adenocarcinoma, for squamous cell, clinical stage, path stage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so if consistently that looked like a good place to draw the line, that would be accepted as, you know, we're going to draw a line here. And there was a lot of internal and external validation, and just briefly, uh, you can you know, categorize validation into a number of different categories. And this is what was done. There's a little bit less that was done for the M group just because of what was uh, available. So it was a pretty sophisticated, internally, externally validated uh, analysis that uh, underlies the staging system. Um, all right, so now let's uh, move on here. So let's go through some of the mundane stuff. So T category was broken down by size into one centimeter increments and just show you the graphs of, you know, how the survival curves kind of panned out. Uh, you know, there were a lot of statistical analyses that uh, went, went into this, uh, show you some of the statistics. And so this is what we ended up with. Um, so uh, T1 is divided into one centimeter increments, T1A, T1B, T1C, um, up to one centimeter, one to two, two to three. Uh, T2 is also divided into one centimeter increments. The other components of T2, visceral pleural invasion or invasion of a main bronchus are still there. Um, the main bronchus is, is different, you know, it used to be whether it was within two centimeters of the carina or beyond that, that actually didn't seem to have any prognostic implication at all, and so that's been dropped. Uh, T3 are tumors that are larger or invading other structures like uh, chest wall, uh, pericardium, uh, uh, phrenic nerve, et cetera. T4 are tumors that are larger yet, greater than seven centimeters, so that's a a change from what we had before. Uh, diaphragm got moved to T4. Uh, other structures like uh, great vessels and uh, 
Carina, Trachea, et cetera, were always within T4 or at least within the last edition. Okay, so let's move on to the end category. So the good news there is that nothing has changed. So N0, no nodes, N1 are nodes within the lung parenchyma, N2 are ipsilateral mediastinal, N3 contralateral mediastinal or supraclav, um, and nothing's really any different. Uh, you see the curves. Um, I didn't give you the statistics there, but uh, that's all the same. So the M category is subdivided into an M1A, M1B for a single distant metastasis and M1C for multiple distant metastases. So that's a change from what we had before. These are survival curves for the M1A, M1B, M1C categories. It didn't really matter for the single metastasis where it was. Um, you know, there was sort of one analysis that made it look like adrenal was maybe worse, but that didn't hold up on other subset analyses, so that was not, you know, singled out. Um, and I would point out that these analyses were all on non-surgically managed patients. So these are not the patients where you said, oh, this is a oligomet, this is a single-sided disease, we're gonna treat this patient with curative intent uh, these were non-surgically managed uh, patients. So then you get to stage groups, uh, and again, there's a, you know, a lot of analysis behind it, this uh, recursive uh, partitioning, uh, regression analysis, uh, a lot of different sort of potential ways of, of uh, grouping them together, uh, both statistical and practical things were taken into account internally, externally validated. Um, and you can look at uh, survival, uh, and basically they were grouped this way. So, you know, certainly we have to recognize that within a stage group that there's some variability there. Um, but once again, I think if you're looking at prognosis, it's driven by a lot of factors beyond just this. Those are the uh, statistics. Um, and so this is the stage grouping that uh, you end up with. Um, so uh, stage, stage 1A is a T1N0, uh, 1B is a, a T2A-N0, um, stage uh, 2A is T2B-N0, stage uh, 2B is T3-N0, but mostly it's T1 and T2. And one stage three is divided into a three A, three B, and three C. So the three C are the T three T fours that have N three disease. So really, a lot of locally advanced disease. And then finally, the uh, stage four is divided into an A and a B, depending on whether you have uh, uh, pleural implants or a. Uh, or uh, distant metastases. So I don't have time to go into this, but uh, we also spent a lot of time, I think this is an area of a lot of confusion. If you have people that have more than one site of disease in the lung, what do you think of that? And uh, we ended up saying there really are several different scenarios that lead to that. Uh, it could be a second primary lung cancer, uh, it could be multifocal ground glass lipidic lung cancer. Um, it could be a mnemonic type of lung cancer or separate tumor nodules. Um, there are definitions for these based on imaging features, path features, how to classify the TNNM. Um, so basically, uh, second primary cancers, you have uh, one that maybe is an adeno or a squam, that's easy. You assign a TNNM to this and a TNNM to that. Um, but I would point out that most second primary lung cancers are the same cell type. Most of them are both adenos or both squames, so you don't often have it that easy. Uh, additional tumor nodules are solid. Uh, tumors, uh, usually a more dominant tumor and a more secondary nodule, uh, and there's a T3, T4, M1A classification that goes into how to classify that. 
I think one of the main things is to recognize that we see a lot of these patients that have multiple areas of ground glass, and if you take it out, it's a lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma or some variation of that. Uh, and these are sort of a separate category where you don't really need to do a lot of extra studies to look at you know, what is the genetic, uh, you know, mutational pattern in one of these lesions versus another one and so forth. If they're lipidic or ground glass, have a, a significant ground glass or lipidic component, they fit into this multiple GGL category and they're staged with a T for the highest T and an M in parentheses. And then we see mnemonic type of lung cancer sometimes, which goes along with the T3, M1A, um, T3, T4, M1A uh, system. Uh, and so I'll just leave this slide up at the end. Um, this is the final stage grouping uh, with a little bit more detail on the T, N, and M. So thank you. <clears throat>